had a pattern, I think, that I didn't break out of for a while that I would, would um, underestimate myself and my possibilities. So, um, and I always had to have someone else kind of tell me, oh, you wouldn't have done that anywhere. You wouldn't have gotten into that anyway. That would make me want to prove them wrong. And then I would do something, um, do something else. But um, I think I only applied to UCI and, Cal and um, Pomona, Pomona College, where the two schools, and UCLA, which I decided not to go to. So you mentioned you visited um, during a uh, uh, kind of college tour or college mm -hmm. trips. Was mm -hmm. that with your family? Yes. Uh, no, I might have been without my family. That might have been um, just um, me with school. It, I think it went through the school. I remember us coming there on a the bus. And there was other students there. I also went to the summer program called SPOP Uniprep, the student parent orientation program, and then Uniprep was you by yourself. So you went at first with your parents for the weekend and then your parents left or maybe it was a different weekend. It's hard to remember, <laughs> it was 40 some years ago. And then you went by yourself. And I remember going to both of those programs and you know, really liking it and um, you know, just you know, feeling really comfortable. I had gone to an all black school elementary, but for junior high and high school, we were bused to a nearby town, it was Gardena, so it wasn't that far, but Gardena was a very diverse school, probably about, you know, 25% Black, 25% White, 25% Asian, 25% Hispanic, so it was very diverse, and that was kind of the first time going to a, to a diverse school. I had always done well in elementary, and I was in the college prep classes and things like that, although in high school, I was, um, I don't know, steered toward being a secretary even though I was in the honors classes. That's one reason I've probably never gone back to my high school to, to speak or anything like that, because I really felt that the counselors did not, um, you know, didn't value the black students. And I remember my counselors telling me, you take shorthand, you take typing, which was all very good. And I'm still no shorthand and things like that. And it was wonderful for taking notes in college and stuff. But I guess she didn't think I was college material, despite, you know, my grades or my you know, SAT scores. It wasn't until I took the PSAT and got really high scores and I started getting a lot of college letters you know, coming in that, you know, and then my mother also had to go up to the school and raise a little hell, excuse me, <laughs> raise a little heck. Yeah. Um, because um, my counselor hadn't even told me to sign up for the, um, for the PSAT. Uh, my mom found out it was happening and she was aware because my brother had gone to college. So she's like, when are you taking the PSAT? I don't know, I don't know when it is, what is that? You know, and she went up to the school and raised Race and Kane, and I remember being signed up late for it and doing really well. But well, I'm glad it all worked out, and you oh, yeah. and mm -hmm. you um, did. You obviously took the test, and you got into UCI. And you mentioned SPOP, which is still a program that takes place to this day. Oh, good. And good. Um, yeah, and so I wondered if you can share a little bit more about your experience with Ooh. SPOP, as much as you you know can remember. What do they um, do? Yeah, I just it's. It, I remember it was a lot of. Fun. It was a lot of fun. It made college seem like it was going to really be fun. Of course, there was no academic aspect at all to SPOP. It was just kind of introducing you to the school. And, um, and I just remember when I came to school, I felt comfortable because I had been there before. I had been in Aldridge Park. I knew how to get to the various places you needed to get to on campus. Um, you know, all the students were, you know, very nice. I didn't feel like I was treated any differently. Um, you know, because, you know, I was black or female or anything like that. And um, I liked it so much that I volunteered. I think the next two years, I was a prop unit prep coordinator myself. Um, I worked as SPOP and unit prep. What I did not work in was SEOP, which was a different program, which I didn't know about um, because I was not, I guess at the time, there were EOP students and they went to the summer EOP program. And EOP and, is... Um, Educational Opportunity Program, I think is what it's called, Summer Educational Opportunity Program. And a lot of the um, Black and Hispanic students, did, some of them were in EOP, not all of them, but some of them were in EOP and they took classes. And I don't know if they were like the, there was some kind of English and math class you had to kind of take before you could even start taking classes at Irvine. You had to kind of pass some class or something. And I think I had tested out during the, um, you know, the advanced placement test or something like that. So I didn't have to take it. So I didn't go to SPOP to um, SEOP, I only went to SPOP Uniprep. And I found when I got to the school, I didn't know a lot of the black students. They all seemed to all know each other before and I didn't know them because I wasn't in SEOP. And that felt a little strange, um, not knowing um, 
you know, a lot of people there and seeing that they all seem to know each other very well, because those programs were a six week program. And the, you know, the SEOP and Uniprep was much shorter. I'm sorry, SPOP and Uniprep were much shorter. So um, I also was an SEOP RA during my time at um, UCI. I spent, you know, the summer being an RA for that program as well. I really liked the summer programs. I thought they really got people acclimated to the school. They got a chance to take some classes, see what it was like to take college classes. Um, and, um, you know, I think it really helped whichever you took, SPOP, Uniprep or SEOP. Were there a number of other um, Black students or other students of color that participated in, in SPOF that you had an opportunity to meet while you were there? No, not that I remember. Um, I think that my roommate ended up coming to SPOF with me, a woman who went to Centennial High School, which was in, in the Compton Unified School District, but we went to the same church. We didn't know each other that well, but when, you know, at church, you know, I always announce very proudly, oh, we have so-and-so going to college, Bridget's going to college, Janelle's going to college, and we both found out we we're going to UC Irvine. So we decided to be roommates, and I believe we went to SPOP together. Um, but other than that, I don't remember really meeting too many people in SPOP and Unipreps. You know, kind of you were in a big group with the group you were put in, and you just did stuff with them. Um, you know, some of those people I probably saw later, but not, nothing that sticks to mind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What was your impression of the students? The students at Irvine, um, I thought they were, you know, all seemed very bright, um, very, they were, seemed very assertive to me. I was very shy and very unassertive when I first went to Irvine. Um, you know, just, just very bright, but very shy. And so, um, you know, people would surprise me, they come up and like snatch your paper out of your hand. What classes do you have? And I'm like, oh God, stop snatching my stuff you know, and stuff like that. So, um, but, um, you know, the students, um, most of them were nice. Um, in fact, you know, almost all of them were nice. It wasn't until I got into my Sierra dorm. I was in the freshman Sierra dorm when they had the Sierra dorm project, which may still be going on. I'm not sure if it's still going on. Um, it was um, Professor um, John Whiteley's um, moral development college students kind of experiment that they did in Sierra dorm where they put a, a bunch of diverse students together and we took dorm class and wrote journals and and um, and learned things like assertiveness training and things like that, which I guess is why Sierra came up. That was probably the most important thing I ever took in my life was assertiveness training in Sierra dorm because I was so unassertive that I would buy shoes that didn't fit oh. because I was too kind of afraid to tell the salesman, oh, these don't, these don't fit or I don't like these. And I would buy them. So, um, so I got to the point that I was actually able to speak up, you know, for myself and say, no, I don't want this. Can you bring me a different size, which seems really reasonable, but it wasn't for me at the time. So um, but, can you, can, yeah, I'm sorry. On. I didn't mean to cut, cut you off. I'm, I'm curious about the Sierra project and um, when it took place. So you started UCI, which year? 1976, the fall of 1976 is when I started at UCI. And um, yeah, that's where I graduated in 76. I was class of 76 in high school. And I started in the fall of 76 and there was an all freshman dorm, which I thought it'd be good to go, you know, live in a dorm with all freshmen, just because I thought, hey, <laughs> I get to, you know, they're in the same boat as I am and stuff. And so there was probably by design, a very diverse group of students in the dorm, you know, some white, some Asian, some Hispanic, and some black. And um, and we, you know, we're dorms, we did stuff together as a dorm. You know, you go to, to the commons together, you play past the glass, which I taught my nieces and nephews, which they thought was hilarious, you know, where <laughs> you make a lot of noise at the restaurant, passing your glasses back and forth and stuff like that. Um, but um, it was, um, the most important part was the dorm class. We each had to write a journal every week, you know, whatever we were thinking. And we had a journal reader and the readers were UCI counselors and professors. Um, um, I remember um, Barbara Burton um, was um, a professor in social ecology and she read my journal. Um, Janet Loxley was, I believe, in the Counseling Center. Um, and at one point she was my journal reader. So you had journal readers and they didn't really comment unless you wanted to talk to them about it. They just kind of, you know, read and might put, oh, that's good or that's interesting or something like that, but didn't really comment. But it gave you a chance to write things you know, just to write things down all the time. And then we had a dorm class where we would discuss, you know, topics, you know, we discuss race, we discussed, um, you know, just, just topics, just to see, I guess, how we would deal with things. We went to, um, 
we went to the mountains once and played sim sock simulated society where some people were the haves and some were the have nots and the haves had food in the nice dorms and the have nots are kind of out there in tents and you know struggling for food and stuff like that so and then we would come back and discuss it all and it was those discussions that were really important that really where you really saw how, what other people felt and mm -hmm. that's the first time I really felt you know kind of a little different at UCI because after one of our discussions about I guess it was about race of some sort one student told I guess me and all the black students that we didn't really deserve to be at UCI because um we were all EOP and got in under special circumstances and didn't really have the grades or the you know the scores to be there and um I was unassertive at times but other times I was way too assertive <laughs> so that time I was not unassertive and I asked her I said oh excuse me tell me what is your GPA and what was your SAT score because I mean I think the SAT at the time it's changed so much. I think at the time the SAT was 1600 maybe was the top and I got like a 15 something I had a really high SAT score and I had like a 3.9 at UCI so I was like because I have a 3.9 and I had a 15 something and I said and I deserve to be here tell me what your scores were and that kind of shut her up and but even though that shut her up we kind of I should say I and we you know kind of followed up with and now I'm going to kick your ass <laughs> 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 oh my word so, so it kind of it got it, we kind of went back went back to the um, neighborhood which is you know which is sad but kind of growing up there were always fights kids were always fighting there was something you got insulted and there was a fight and it was did, just you, did you actually I mean, have a did you actually have a fight no, well, we chased her upstairs and she went up to her oh, dorm okay. and we sat at the bottom of the stairs and hollered insults at her for about an hour or so as it was time to go to dinner. Then we went to dinner. <laughs> then it was over. <laughs> it was okay. <laughs> but I feel kind of bad because I feel like that was definitely not the best way to handle that situation. It could have been over with the, uh, look, my grades are better than yours. Just go away and shut up. But it turned into, you know, and now we're going to really show you why you shouldn't have said that about us. But um, that's kind of, you know, was one of the first things that hit me that you know this was a little bit different that people didn't look at me the way I was looking at me you know just mm -hmm. as a regular person and then things became more obvious like people asking like what does your hair look like when it's wet <laughs> you know, just like wet hair you know <laughs> just like that's what it looks like and things like that so that's when it got a little more uncomfortable to Irvine but Sierra helped because we talked all that through mm -hmm. we got a chance to talk it through we got a chance to tell people why we don't want you touching don't touch my hair you know, don't ask me questions like that. I'm not asking you those questions and things like that. So we got to get through all that. I mean, we watched Roots together. It came out in 77. And so we watched it as a dorm together. And that was a very difficult, you know, thing to watch because, you know, at, at times in, in, you know, watching Roots, it was very, you know, it was, it was, it was, it affected, it affected people, you know, different ways and stuff like that. And sometimes people, we're not as affected as we were as we were affected. It's like, well, it wasn't that bad. And I don't I think they're making it worse. And it's like, oh God, no, it was way worse. So, but we we discussed all that, which was the helpful part about Sierra. We discussed it every pod, you know, each there were like five or five or six rooms that were in a pod in a section of the dorm. And each pod had a dorm, I guess they called a resident assistant. No, that was the RA, resident advisor, staff. I guess they just called them staff. So they were in the pods to talk to us as well. And so um, the people in my pod, you know, most of them I still know. We had a 40 year reunion for Sierra Dorm a couple of years ago. And um, I came back and we actually slept in our old rooms and met up with some of the old people. And it was just like yesterday. It was so fun to meet the old people. Everything seems so much smaller though. I was like, oh my God, did I used to fit in the shower? <laughs> it, was just, it, was, it was much smaller, but to, to go back and spend the night in the dorm was something else. And to see the people that you met, you know, 40 years ago when you were freshmen, that was really nice. And that was all part of the Sierra project. So it was just the freshman year and then, and then that you was just went freshman on year, to... But the next year I helped out as staff in the okay. Sierra project. And then the final year, I was the RA. Or my final year, my junior year, I was the RA. So I was involved in the Sierra Project for three years. And John Whiteley actually asked me to help write his book um, on the Sierra Project. So even before I went to, um, to law school, I had a, a book authorship on, on my credit, you know, <laughs> Moral Development College Students by John Whiteley, Barbara Burton, and Bridget Barry Smith. It was very cool. Yeah. So, um, so that was nice. That was probably one of the most influential things to me on campus was... Sierra Project, 
we learned how to interview, you know, how to speak in front of people, you know, just again, assertiveness training was huge for me, you know, stuff like that. Um, and that's the stuff I learned outside of the classroom that was much more, that affected me much more in my life than anything I learned in the classroom. Because mm. I was, my question, my next question was going to be, you know, what did you take away from um, your experience uh, with Sierra? Um, that first year onto the to the next ones that you were, um, you know, uh, part of uh, the leadership team there. Mm -hmm. So, what are some of the you know lessons or aspects of that um, experience that you carry with you? Yeah. Well, I guess one of the things I learned is that everybody wasn't, um, you know, just because you were black, you didn't have the same experience maybe as other blacks, and just because you're white, you weren't always, you know, kind of you know rich or or, um, or, or prejudice or anything like that. Everybody was different and you have to, I did learn to judge people more, you know, by who they were and who they showed me they were as opposed to just looking at them and deciding, okay, they won't like me because, you know, they're white or she's going to like me because she's black. I mean, I met black people in Sierra who were from, you know, upper class neighborhoods and we went to, um, we went to LA to a frat game, a Greek show, um, a frat game at Morningside High and a shooting rang out in the gym and all of us had grown up in a black neighborhood, you know, knew the sound of gunshots and knew that when you hear gunshots, you duck, you know, you get down. And my two friends who were from Sierra, who were from San Bernardino had no clue. And <laughs> they were just sitting up looking around like, what's going on? And we had to like pull them down and stuff. So it just hit me that everybody, you know, who's black didn't grow up the same way. And everybody, you know, you know, uh, clearly who's white or Asian or whatever, didn't grow up the same way. So that, mm -hmm. um, you know, that stuck with me just to judge people by who they are and don't and don't prejudge them until they do something that shows you how they are you know because some people do stuff really quick to show you who they are <laughs> and then you know um and then you can um you know let their actions speak for them and so that was something um something i learned i learned just to um just you know speak up for myself and go you know for what i wanted to go for and you know not doubt myself i never had a problem in school at uci i was very involved in a lot of stuff I would take 20 and 24 units and still get straight A's. I was really good at time management. Another thing they taught at Sierra, they taught you time management, which was really important. They taught you learning skills, how to take notes and things like that. Like I said, I already took shorthand, so I could already take notes really fast, but they taught you how to take notes, what was important. They gave us access to, we had a learning skills center on campus. I remember the guy's name was Larry and Audre Al-Hamid, they became um, mentors of mine as well in the Learning School Center, and I even worked there for a while. So Sierra opened up a lot of doors, introduced you to a lot of people that, um, you know, really could help you, that wrote letters of recommendation for me, um, that, you know, encouraged me, like, you know, why don't you try out to be a spot unit prep coordinator? You know, why don't you try out to be a Mesa Court RA? You know, that kind of stuff, which I ended up doing. You mentioned that um, Sierra was just, you know, one among many activities that you were involved in. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me um, more about the other things that you participated in while you were at UCI? Well, um, Sierra was my freshman dorm when I was really involved in everything in Sierra. And I was my first, I guess it was quarter, we were quarter system at UCI. I took classes on Tuesday and Thursday and I went home on Thursday and I didn't come back to Tuesday. So I went home and hung out with my friends at home and didn't even really hang out in the dorm. It wasn't until after that first quarter and after kind of the Sierra class got started and I got to know people a little better that I was comfortable just staying at school. And then I didn't even want to go home. I just wanted to hang out, hang out at Irvine um, all the time. But um, after my, at the end of my freshman year, I ended up being invited to join um, Alpha Cap Alpha Sorority, which is the first black, um, um, sorority for college educated women and um, also we were the first black Greek organization on the UCI campus so I joined Alpha Cap Alpha and there had been women at the school who were you know older you know juniors and seniors who had been trying for years to get AKA accepted and, and on the UCI campus and they finally did it by their senior year and I was a freshman so they invited me to join at that point and then they all graduated so once they graduate, there were like three of us left who were still there. And um, so we kind of got a chance to build that from the ground up. So, so I was very involved in Alpha Cap Alpha. I was the president for the last two years of Alpha Cap Alpha for Alpha Cap Alpha. And it's still going on the UCI campus now, 45 years later, it's been there 
um, continuously, which which is a source of great pride for me. Um, yeah. I was involved in, um, because I went to church, I was involved in the gospel choir, basic, which is brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, I'm trying to think, BSU, I was all involved in that. Mesa Court RA, staff member, spot unit prep. I, I did a lot. I think the more I did, just the, the happier I was. I mm. just, you know, just like to have my fingers in a lot of pies and do a lot of stuff. Um, it, it sounds like um, when you put the timeline in place for um, Alpha Kappa Alpha, you were really, um, you know, a, a significant reason for its sustainability. <laughs> if you're only one of, the, you know, one of three um, left after uh, several members mm -hmm. graduate, right. um, can you tell me about, you know, what? Um, you and your um, your sister's vision was for maintaining the organization um, at UCI. Well, I guess it was it was fairly easy to sustain because it was um, well. Again, we were the first there, so it was kind of different to have you know Black Greeks on campus. Um, a lot of people were looking for sisterhood and as a way also of doing service in the community, which we were able to do. We had an, even though there were only three of us on campus, there was a graduate chapter in Orange County outside that really supported us um, a lot. And people really came to us. I mean, we didn't have to do much. People saw what we were doing. They come and they want, you know, to be a part and stuff. So um, I think by the time I graduated, there were probably 20, 20 some people in the chapter mm -hmm. um, when I graduated. It's gotten much smaller. And I don't know if the numbers at UCI of Black women have shrunk or what, but it just seems like there was a lot more women, because by the time I graduated, we had Alpha Kappa Alpha, and we also had Delta Sigma Theta, which was another, um, you know, um, um, prominent black um, black sorority. And then we had two fraternities, the Alphas mm -hmm. and the Kappas by the time I graduated. So we had a, a little thriving Greek community there, and all the groups had at least, you know, 10 to 15 um, members, you know, in them. So, um, so it wasn't hard to keep the membership because people were coming to us. You know, we actually didn't even take all the people that wanted to be to be a member. Um, but um, and then um, as we got a community going, we did a lot more Greek things. You know, we do parties together with the Kappas. We do car washes with, you know, with this group. We would, you know, go and volunteer at this church and stuff like that. So it just, you know, it just gave you just a whole nother outlet, you know, something to do. And then opened you up to a whole different, you know, Black Greek world that, you know, mm -hmm. we were not um so um, I also got very involved in AK and I'm still involved in AK to this day. But even as an undergraduate, I was on a national committee and they would fly me to Atlanta for things like that. So I'd meet AKs from all over. So it was wonderful. That was, I said Sierra was the biggest part of my time. I used to, I would probably AK and Sierra. I would put those two, um, you know, neck and neck were probably the biggest, um, you know, influences on my life that, um, you know. Sierra helped me, I think, you know, in my life, AK probably helped me socially, I think. Mm. Mm -hmm. What kind of um, uh, community work would you do in Orange County? We would go to, oh Lord, there was a lady at AK, I can't remember her name, but she owned like a preschool. And we would go and volunteer to work at her preschool. Or we would have a dance where instead of having to pay 50 cent or a dollar, we would collect canned goods. Mm -hmm. And then we'd take the canned goods to the food bank um, or we collect clothing and take it. There were a couple of black churches, Second Baptist Church is still around that we went to and we would do things, um, you know, for the church and things, take things there, stuff like that. Cause there wasn't a lot, a lot of, you know, quote unquote black stuff in Orange County, but you know, you know, the churches and the sororities were, you know, two of the few that we could hook onto and do stuff with. Um, so that's what we did. We would sell, gosh, almost every Wednesday we would sell, um, what do you call those things? Hotling sandwiches right in front of that gateway library and stand in front of gateway and sell, you know, sandwiches, I guess they were a dollar or we'd have bake sales and sell money so that we could give money to, you know, United Negro College Fund or wherever, you know, the money was going to go to and stuff like that. But the hot link sales, I remember those were probably our most popular things. People would be waiting to come and get a hot link on a hot dog fund and stuff like that. So, um, so um, we, you know, we did a lot and it was just, I don't know, it just seemed like it was all really fun. It was just, you know, you got up each morning, you're happy about what you were doing and, and excited about stuff and still managed, you know, to get through school. You had to keep your grades up, you know, to remain an active, you know, an active person in the sorority as well. Grades were also important. Yeah, we've been focusing so far on a lot of the social aspects of your college experience, but I absolutely want to know about your academic 
um, experience at UCI as well. Um, so uh, can you tell me a little bit more about your major and how you chose it? Yeah, I came into UCI undeclared because I really knew I wanted to be a judge. I still had that judge thought in my head and um, didn't really see a major you know, to be a judge. And somebody told me, oh, just be a social science major or something like that. And I thought, oh, I'll just wait. So I was undeclared until I took um, criminal justice in the social ecology is one of those big classes that was seven o'clock, you know, in the social ecology or it might have been the science lecture hall. I don't think social, social ecology didn't have a building. I think it was in the science lecture hall, just a big lecture class. And I really enjoyed that and um, decided that social ecology, and I like the way social ecology had field study as well, that you would have to do field study in order to graduate. So I think probably maybe midway through my sophomore year, I decided to go social ecology. But when I first started, um, um, at, at Irvine, again, I had done really well in school, really well in the SATs, but wasn't really that confident. And, um, you know, went to my classes, was usually pretty quiet, you know, just taking notes and, and studying and things like that, and not really doing too well. Then I got, you know, really good grades. I think I got three A's and a B or something my first um, quarter. And then I realized, okay, this is what I know. I can do this. And then, um, you know, after that, most of the classes I took, it were, you know, I think I graduated with 3.92. I had a very high um, GPA. I remember there was one class I was in, I can't remember, it might've been a psychology class, another big class and myself and a bunch of black students were called in for cheating. And I'm like, huh? <laughs> it's like, what are, you, what are you talking about? And we got called in the private professor and he said that so many of us had the same answer or something like that on the class. And I just said, hey, I'll take the, you know, I know this stuff. I, I will take it right now. I, I had, I didn't have a photographic memory, but I had a really good memory. So I could almost remember what was on the page. And um, I'm like, I can take the you know, course right now. Ask me a question. I'll answer it. And so he asked me a couple of questions. I asked somebody, he says, okay, you can go. It's not you. <laughs> so, so I don't know, don't remember what happened. I believe I heard later that maybe some people were sitting behind others and copying the person in front of them and stuff like that. I don't know what happened. It didn't in, end up with anyone getting kicked out of school or anything like that, which I know is a, which is a, problem, but I do remember telling the professor that I know this stuff. You can test me anytime. And, um, and he gave me a few questions and he told me, you know, get out of my office. You're okay. <laughs> so, um, but um, other than that, I mean, academics came really easy to me. I would tutor other people and stuff like that. I was the type of person that would, people wouldn't see me study because I was a really early riser and I would get up maybe three in the morning and do my work and um, study. And then, you know, those those counselors in high school who, you know, didn't really want me to go to college, in my opinion, the typing and the shorthand, you know, really helped. And I would also type other people's papers for them. And at the time I correct their grammar and stuff like that, like, oh no, this is all wrong. Let me fix this and stuff like that. So um, yeah, I mean, I can't even really tell you much about that game because I don't remember it. I just remember, you know, I was kind of, I, I liked learning. I liked reading. I always liked to read. And um, so um, I would, you know, read, read my assignments and learn stuff and then try to help others. And that also helped me, I found, when I um, was helping others understand the material, I guess it was going over to my own head as well. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, academically, it wasn't hard. I ended up being Phi Beta Kappa and Magna Cum Laude and stuff like that. Um, but it wasn't, um, I never had a problem academically at Irvine. And that was never an issue for me. Were there particular classes or um, faculty that were influence, influential to you? I mean, the faculty I remember were people like Audrey and Larry in the Learning Skills Center that would teach me about how to take a multiple choice test mm -hmm. and things like that. I mean, they were so good that when I was sitting in multiple choice tests, I would see what they were telling me about like, Remember, there, there'll be a good answer, but then there'll be a better answer. I always look for the better answer and stuff like that. And I would say, oh, I see what this professor is doing. This is the good answer, but this is the better answer. So I would, um, so that would, that um, resonated with me. The field study classes, I remember, because I went out and worked with, um, there were girls in a group home. And I remember they gave me $10 and told me to go buy a girl her school wardrobe with $10, and this was still, you know, 78, 79, but $10 still was not a lot of money to buy a school wardrobe for someone. And she wanted to take half the money and buy eyelashes. She was, um, she was kind of a G13 Hispanic and she wanted to, you know, have that kind of 
long eyelash, you know, puff hair look. And I was like, we only have $10. We have to buy underwear. <laughs> we can't do that and stuff. But um, that stuck with me more, the fact that, you know, there are kids in these homes who, you know, didn't have, you know, even what I grew up with. And, and as I grew up and got older, I realized that people considered, they didn't consider my neighborhood middle class. You know, they consider us a little lower than that. But I thought I was, you know, well, well ensconced in the middle class. And um, it was um, just shocking to see kids who had really nothing um, compared to that. So that stuck with me, just that the thought that there are people, you know, who don't have anything. And that kind of made me start wanting to maybe be a public defender as well. So I started kind of seeing people that really needed, um, you know, really needed legal help. And, um, and I wanted to do something like that. So I had a little bit of a bleeding heart. Or, or maybe it was a charging on a white horse heart. I don't know what it was, but I had something like that. Um, but yeah, I don't really remember any other, you know, classes, you know, professors, Barbara Burton, John Whiteley, again, he, I worked on the book with him. Um, I'm thinking it was more people like Janet Lacks in the Counseling Center, Jim Craig, who worked in housing, people like that would give me a lot of advice. Janet Lacks, especially, she was, you know, very helpful even before I went to law school she kind of took me to the side and told me that, you know, as I went higher in education, there would be fewer black men that were going higher with me. You know, just, she just wanted to let me know, that, you know, as I went higher, the black men were kind of lagging behind a little bit and stuff like that. So, you know, if you're like, if you're looking for a mate, Bridget, just know that you have to maybe broaden, broaden your horizon or, or something like that, so they were the people who really stuck with me. Like I said, it was outside the classroom stuff that I remember at Irvine. That's what made it so, so special. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'd still, you know, when people, you know, ask about your alma mater, I always say it's UC Irvine. You know, I went to law school at Stanford, but UC Irvine is my alma mater because that's where I felt I was formed. Yeah. Are there friends um, and associates that you maintain relationships with after uh, you graduated? Oh, yeah. Oh, um, yes, I'm um, still my roommate. We were roommates for, I guess, three years. The only year we weren't roommates was the year I was an RA and had my room in the dorm. But Janelle, the woman that I ended up being freshman with, um, some other people I met in Sierra, you know, John Elston, he lives around the corner from me. We, you know, we still talk and tease each other on our birthdays. Um, um, Jack Sapp was the head of the Brothers and Sisters in Christ and, um, I saw him, his daughter went to law school and I, I went to her graduation and we used to prank each other something horrible when we were freshmen. That was one of the things I really remember is that we would play horrible pranks on each other. I would, Janelle and I would put lotion in his and his roommate's beds because no one locked their doors back then. Like today, I'm sure people locked their doors. We didn't have computers or anything like that. We didn't have to lock our doors. We didn't have anything. And so we'd leave your doors open. So when they were gone to class, we'd go in their room and we'd unmake their bed and just fill it with a whole bottle of lotion and make it back up. <laughs> so then they come and, you know, get into bed and all of a sudden you hear screams and we would have our door locked by then so they couldn't get in, but they knew it was us. And one time we came back from, from um, class and we were walking through Mason's Court and you kind of walked past where the post office was and the, um, where we ate, the, the commons, I guess is what they called. And there was a volleyball court. And there are all these things fluttering in the volleyball court. And we went up there and it was our underwear. They had taken our bras and our panties and hung them on the volleyball court. <laughs> we just had to, and of course we had to get them because you couldn't leave them out there. You needed them. So we had to go up in front of everybody, collect our underwear and bring them in. <laughs> so, and it was just an ongoing the entire year. We just kept doing, you would walk into the dorm and someone would pour water from you from the second floor balcony and stuff like that. So. But um, I'm still, um, you know, in touch with, with Jack. Um, my sorority sisters, definitely. Um, even um, the second year when I moved out of Sierra, I moved in the Cumbre dorm and we called ourselves the Cumbre gang. And we were just going to get together a few weeks ago, but then this Omicron, um, you know, virus kind of came, got kind of bad and we decided let's put it off a little bit, but we're still hanging out together. So, um, and again, the 40th year reunion, coming back and seeing, you know, our, our dorm presidents were Jack and Jill, and we saw them, and Mr. Les, you know, um, Lester, just Lavon, uh, God, Lamont Jarrett, who was a basketball player at UCI, and he became, um, I guess, a Newport Beach police officer. Mm. 
you know, he pulled me over for a ticket one time. And I was like, oh my God, I'm getting a ticket. And then I saw him unfold himself out of his car because he was like six, seven or something. He, you know, really, really long legs. And when I saw him get out of the car, I just started laughing because it was him. But um, yeah, those people I still, you know, keep in touch with. We don't, you know, haven't really seen a lot to, of too many people in the last couple of years, but, um, but um, definitely keep in touch. It sounds like a thriving, it was a thriving Black community. Mm -hmm. I mean, how, how would you describe it? How large was it? That's what I thought. It seemed like it was larger than it is now. I have still been involved in UCI. Up until last year, I was the graduate advisor for the Alpha Cap Alpha chapter on campus. I was the advisor for like the last 15 years or so. So I was always up on campus and seeing the Black community. And I was kind of surprised at how small it was and how insular and that that they didn't really support each other the way we did because even you know when we were if we gave something the other black Greeks would go but also the other black students would go it wasn't be just Greek, Greeks everybody would come and we would have a big group and I would say we I don't know it seems like there were more then than there are now but I doubt it I mean Irvine is so much bigger now that's probably the difference see like when I was at Irvine we had six or seven thousand students total um, and maybe we had two or 300 Blacks, and now they might have two or 300 Blacks, but maybe they have eight, I don't know, 20,000 students. Irvine is huge now. You know, going up there and finding a parking space is like, you know, it's like, like winning the lottery if you can find a place to park. Um, so it just seems like we, we did have a thriving community because we had, you know, we had a gospel choir with 30 or 40 people in it. You know, we had a, a Bible study, you know, each of the sorority fraternities, you know, average, you know, 10, 15, 20 people in them. Um, yeah, so it just seems like we had a big community and people were very supportive of each other. Um, and it just seems like what I see now is that they still have, you know, the BSU, but they kind of do their own thing and the sororities does their own thing and people don't really come, come together. And then there's just a lot of people, there weren't a lot of, you know, Blacks at Irvine that were not involved in the black community, everybody's kind of pulled in and made mm -hmm. to feel welcome. And I don't see that now. You see kind of people just kind of scattered around and maybe not really knowing other people. Um, so that seems a little different, I don't know. And maybe because we all started off either in Sierra dorm or mm -hmm. the people start off in SEOP. I don't even know if they still do a program like SEOP where they kind of got to know each other for six weeks on campus before school even started. But yeah, it was thriving, it was nice. It was nice, even though there was, Orange County was pretty prejudiced on the outside. Definitely got stopped by police when I was at school. Once I remember driving down Jamboree going towards Newport to take um, another black student from Oakland home. He lived in Newport with some roommates and, um, and I had a car, so I was just giving him a ride home and we got stopped on Jamboree at night and they kept us there probably an hour. You know, they, they took my license, they checked the registration. I heard a crackle back on the radio. The car was registered to my father, which is what I told them, et cetera, et cetera. And then they still had us sitting there. And then um, they said, I asked where we were going. And I said, I'm taking them home to Irvine. They told us black people, I mean, to Newport Beach. No blacks live in Newport Beach. It was just, just plain old harassment. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I just remembered that or going swimming and people would throw soap into the pool and okay. say, um, you know, wash the black off and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So those kind of things would happen when you were outside of the Irvine campus. The Irvine campus was, you know, insular and quote unquote safe. But when you went outside, you know, to Albertson or to somebody's apartment to swim or just, you know, drive somebody home, that's when some of the prejudice would come in. Um, but, you know, you learn how to deal with that like everything else. Yeah. How, how did you all deal with it? Well, I remember trying to calm down my friend. He, his name was Laverne, and he um, was very angry. You know, he was very angry, and I just remember, you know, just from past dealings, you know, seeing the police that you don't anger the police, you don't jump out and jump back. You just sit there and wait till it's over. So it was just kind of, you know, letting Laverne know, just be calm, Laverne. Just sit down. They're gonna have to let us go eventually. There's nothing wrong. We're not doing anything wrong. And eventually they did let us go and they followed us until I dropped Laverne off at his apartment and he went inside and then they peeled away. So, mm. so it's just the kind of thing you just kind of not necessarily grin and bear it, you just bear it. You just bear it until it's over. And, um, and then, you know, just kind of nowadays with, with all that's going on lately, you know, you're happy to get out of it alive, you know, 
because you know so many of those situations turn bad really quickly so but um back then that was the only thing Irvine was 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 fairly prejudiced on the outside definitely got followed around if you went to South Coast Plaza hmm. or anything like that um, but you know you know it is it is what it is it also like I said it was a, I remember it more as a joyous time so definitely I remember enjoying all my time at UCI. My younger sister would, like I said, was two years younger. She would come up for the weekends just to hang out at Irvine just because she thought it was so fun as well. So let's see, I'm trying to think of any other Irvine things I want to make sure I mention. Um, hmm. Oh, I did want to mention, you asked about fondest memories of UCI. Um, uh oh, I think we're frozen. Dr. Trivet? Here I am. I'm back. Okay, I'm sorry. It looked like either you froze or I froze. I don't know what happened. It, it was it was me, but I could tell it was my internet connection dropped. Okay, no, mine usually goes bad. <laughs> mine goes bad um, as well. Um, hmm. What was I gonna say? Oh, one of my fondest memories of Irvine was it seems like I don't know if it was. Black History Month that we had a Martin Luther King Day or something like that. And um, Coretta Scott King came to campus. Oh, wow. That's and amazing. She was, um, she was also a member of my sorority. She was an AK and I was AK president. So at the end of her talk, I believe it was during like the Martin Luther King Symposium, I think when it first started, she came and I got to go up on stage and give her pink roses, you know, to, you know, just thank her for coming to campus and stuff like that. And I still remember that. And I can even remember how good that she smelled. It was either her or the roses, something just, I had this smell in my head that I remember from that. And I remember that. And then, you know, besides some of the pranks we, we played in Sierra, those were my fondest memories ever arrived. Do you re recall what year um, she came to UCI? I want to say it had to be 79 or 80 because I was, I remember I was chapter president and I was mm -hmm. chapter president both of those years. So I had to give her the flowers or I was, I was, I was blessed enough to be able to give her the flowers. I didn't have to, but I was able to give her the flowers. So, and I'm just trying to think, Martha King was, it, it's just so hard. He, oh yeah, we could have been having him on the King Symposium by then. It seems like that was kind of soon, but he, I guess he was killed in 68. So I guess it wasn't, it could, that was 10 years later. So I guess it could have been. Um, when did the holidays start? I don't know. It's it's hard to remember. Um, but um, it was sometime around the time they were trying to get the holiday started and all that stuff as well. Mm. Yeah. Do you remember what she talked about? Oh no, <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a clue. <laughs> Just excited about being there, and I knew I had the flowers, and I was going to get to meet her. So I don't remember at all. <laughs> What she thought about, I'm just, that's why I was trying to remember when the holiday started, because maybe they, we were still in the midst of, you know, trying to get the holiday done, and maybe she was coming to do that, but I just thought, you know, her coming to UCI was just something big, um, mm -hmm. but you know, UCI had a lot of, I remember that we had, um, there was a show on ABC called Superstars or something like that, and there were all these, um, these, um, you know, entertainers who would come and do athletic endeavors against each other like play tug of war and race and all this other stuff and I remember you know Gladys Knight and the Jackson Five all these people would be at Irvine and doing these these programs and stuff like that which was um I also remember you know going to those that was really exciting who would advocate who would organize or advocate for for to these get those guys? there yeah who, I, Superstars was a big program on TV, so I don't know who got that. I don't know if it was ASUCI or the school. I just remember I was probably a freshman or a sophomore when they came. I just remember going over, you know, to the athletic field, and there they were, and you can go up and get it, you know, get autographs and stuff like that. And we were just basically watching the taping of the show and stuff like that. But it was being done at Irvine. I mean, I guess it's like the way the Rams practice at Irvine. I don't know who who arranges that kind of stuff, but whoever does, they're doing a good job. <laughs> say bravo bravo so um so hmm. what year did you graduate 1980 i graduated in 1980 and ended up leaving irvine to go to to stanford law school and it was another one of those situations where i kind of underestimated myself and i i applied to maybe six law schools i didn't apply to any of the top 10 law schools i don't even know why i just applied you know UCLA, USC, 
Gonzaga. Some of the schools are kind of around. Gonzaga's not around except in Washington, but kind of around here. And I remember again, you know, a a um, student who wasn't black come up to me and asked me where I was going to law school or where I was applying. And I told her she was also applying to law school. And she said, "Oh, you're not applying to um, Harvard or Stanford or anything." And I said, "No, no, don't really. You know, man, I didn't know anything about them." And she says, "Ah, just as well. You wouldn't get in anyway." And I was like, "Ah." <laughs> so once again, somebody had to, somebody else had to push me to do what I was able to do on my own. And when she said that, I, you know, my stubborn side said, "Well, I'm gonna prove her wrong." And I remember I went home and I sent my applications off, and. Um, I got a letter back so quickly from Stanford that I thought I had just left something off my application. I mean, it came back, you know, and it was just a small letter. You always had the, 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 um, the lore back then was if you got a big envelope, you got in. If you got a small envelope, you got a no thank you type thing. And Stanford just sent a regular small envelope, but it came so quickly. I thought, well, they couldn't have rejected me this quickly. So maybe I left something off and I opened it up and it was, you know, congratulations. You know, you've been accepted to the class of, you know, I think it was whatever it was, 1983. And I'm like, what? <laughs> and so, um, and then I ended up getting into, um, I got in all the law schools I applied to, but Harvard as well. And I remember going to Stanford because they actually sent students down from Stanford to visit me in Irvine, to tell me about the school and tell me to come, black students, to tell me to come. Um, and I got a call from the Dean of Admissions at Stanford. And I remember, I remember Harvard, I felt like I was just a number. It was just like, let us know when you're coming type thing. And um, Stanford was actually doing serious, almost recruiting to get us to come and stuff. So, but yeah, that was another, I had a lot of those situations where I just didn't ever, you know, go for the A. I always just kind of went for, oh, I'll just get this. I know I can get this instead of going for something way up there. So um, I've gotten over that. <laughs> I've gotten over that now, but at Irvine, I still was, I was still there, um, but. Yeah, I graduated in 80. Um, I remember getting the, um, what is it called? The, the chancellor at the time was Dan Aldrich. And I got the Outstanding Senior, Dan and Jean Aldrich Outstanding Senior Award when I graduated. Mm -hmm. And my mom had to go and get it for me at the Lots and Laurels Banquet because I was um, at an AK Banquet getting an award there. So I went to the AK Banquet instead of the UC Irvine Banquet. I remember that. But um, yeah, Irvine was, was, was wonderful to me. I'm glad I, I chose Irvine. I don't know if the same things would have happened at UCLA. It was such a bigger school. I think I needed to be in that, in that smaller pond and, um, and to you know, land in a place like Sierra that really helped me. Yeah. Um, what would you say, um, or how, if at all, would, um, did your UCI experience and the skills or knowledge that you gained from UCI um, impact you or prepare you for life after college? Definitely prepared me. Um, you know, just again, the things I learned outside the classroom at UCI, the learning to be assertive, learning how to study, um, you know, learning that kind of do things your own way you know don't do don't, don't do things the way other people say you should do it if you know this works for you then do you know do your own thing stick up for yourself that kind of stuff just really helped you know going to Stanford again you know you're getting there and again I was kind of felt like a you know very very small fish all these people were very accomplished a lot of the students in law school were had been out and working or had been there was a guy in my section who had been a doctor and just got tired of being a doctor decided he was going to go to law school we had um, um, Supreme Court Justice Hugo Black, U.S. Supreme Court Justice Hugo Black's grandson was in my class and was actually my partner because his last name was Black and mine was Barry and stuff like that. So you had uh, all these people who were really doing a lot. And I just felt like, oh, God. And even going to Stanford, there were only three people in my class at Stanford who went to a UC school. Almost everybody were, so, you know, the Harvard, Yales, Princeton, Cornells of the world and stuff like that. So I remember feeling like a small fish. But you know, stuff I learned at UCI, my learning skills, you know, being assertive, you know, doing what worked for me since I, you know, would get up early and study. I kept doing that. When people wanted to do study groups, I never studied well in a study group. I always studied well by myself and then I could come back and study with other people, but I had to do it by myself first. I just continued to do that in Stanford and after the first quarter at Stanford, just like the first quarter at Irvine, once I, you know, saw that I could do this, it was smooth sailing after that. But um, I just think that, you know, Irvine just, 
teaching you how to deal with other people, you know, and to believe in myself more than anything else. I think Irvine, you know, taught me that. And that was what I learned from the Janet Loxies and the Barbara Burtons and Jim Craig's of the world that, you know, that, you know, that I could do this and just be myself. And it was, and it was good enough, even though I didn't have the same background as other people or anything like that. Yeah, even when I got to be a lawyer, I worked in a Wall Street law firm, one of the very first luncheons, they went around and asked every new associate what their father did, which is just a weird question <laughs> to begin with now thinking about why would you ask about the fathers, not the mothers, but not even so just going around and you know, you're hearing, oh, my father's vice president, Arco, oh, my father owns a jewelry store, oh, my father, you know, that says has his own law firm. And then they got to me and I said, oh, my father's a garbage collector. And I said, in fact, he collects, you know, right down at city hall on Wednesdays. And if I see his truck, I run down there and try to, you know, say hi. And the whole room just erupted in laughter because they thought I was kidding. And it was like, uh, you know, you had that, I'm not in Kansas anymore moment again. <laughs> it's like, uh-oh, but you know, I just kind of waited till, you know, the laughter died down and people were looking at me like, uh-oh. And then somebody says, you're not kidding. I said, no. No, and it was just, it just became a thing because after that, all the partners who weren't at that luncheon kept coming to my office apologizing and it just, you know, just making it worse, basically. Who, who did it? Who said it? Who laughed? Who did this? It's just like, just leave me alone. It's okay. It's over and stuff like that. But just kind of reminded you that, that while my experience wasn't the same as their experience, my work, my work was as good or better um, than theirs. So it didn't matter at that point it's just what you were able to produce and stuff so so and i think a lot of that you know i got from uci you know maybe before uci i wouldn't have been able to deal with stuff like that you shared so much about um the black community and the coming together <laughs> that you all did or the support um mm -hmm. that you felt while you were there mm -hmm. um and you know, currently at UCI, there's um, a lot of conversation and, and um, exploration of ways in which to improve um, the experiences of um, Black faculty and staff here, mm -hmm. students, of course. Um, and so I wonder if you have any reflections on thriving at UCI? Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah, you know, it's hard. It, it, it just seems like students today are different. They're very into, you know, what their resume looks like. And maybe they tell you to do this at UCI, but I noticed in the last five or six years, students, when they would send me an email, would have at the bottom their name and their major and the year they graduate and what they're doing on campus, they'd have a big old paragraph under their name. and you know, we never did that. I said they were more worried about kind of where they're going to end up as opposed to what you're doing right now and stuff like that. Um, but I think it's, you know, like I said, I don't know if they do SEOP. I guess they still do pop, spot unit prep. It seems like people just don't know each other, or get to know each other um, as well. And maybe there's just, the, you know, the diaspora is just too large or something right now. It seems like most of us who came in most of the black students, at least who came into UCI, we were coming from, you know, Centennial and Washington and, you know, schools kind of all in the same, you know, area. And, you know, some from, you know, San Bernardino and places further out, but, you know, and most of us have come from black communities. So we were looking for other black students that we would feel comfortable with. I think now, like, you know, my own son, he grew up in Orange County. You know, he was the only black at his school sometimes. Um, and I think that when he went to college, he went to Berkeley and he also went to Stanford Law School, but um, he didn't look for a black community when he got to school, whereas we were looking for somewhere that we could feel comfortable. And I think because people have such a broader, um, you know, background that maybe they're not looking for that the way we were. So we came together naturally. I mean, there was a portion of comments that used to call the ghetto because we all ate there. <laughs> it was just. And it was just the way it was. I mean, you know, in some respects, it, it, it's not good because we're segregating ourselves. In the other respects, we were, it made us comfortable. We felt somewhere we had to go. And even though I ate in the ghetto, sometimes I didn't. Sometimes I would go and eat with people in my dorm. Sometimes I would go and eat with, you know, with people that I worked with in ASUCI, you know, and stuff like that. So um, it's like I had a choice. 
and I don't know if if students this time if they feel they have a choice now. Um, and it just seems like everybody's kind of a little bit, you know, out for themselves and they just, you know, really busy. I'm sure COVID didn't help, you know, being, you know, at home and stuff like that and not even being on campus. Um, but yeah, I wish there was something. When I would talk to the other Black Greek advisors, my probably seven, eight years ago, there were enough Black Greeks on campus that each group had their own advisor and we would meet. And um, we would talk about, let's try to do something together, like bring our students together so they could meet and do stuff together because they weren't doing anything together the way we used to do. They, so they don't, everybody does their own thing. And maybe we need people need to try to be more um, collaborative. That might help. Or maybe find something out in the community that everybody can agree on and do that and stuff like that. So everyone doing their own projects. But, you know, yeah, I don't know. I think it was a different time and we were coming from a different place that we, I think we needed each other. And, and um, now people come from different places and don't think they need that as much. But if people are feeling alone, maybe they still do and they just don't realize it. Yeah. So I'm not very helpful. <laughs> I'm not very helpful there. Um, but. No, thank you for, for sharing your thoughts. Mm -hmm. um, it's really interesting to hear from your perspective, yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah, um, yeah. I really, I wanted to do this because I really, you know, felt that, um, like I said, I really enjoyed my years at UCI. Um, it was very good for me. I was successful there, and I just wanted, I wanted to make sure that there was some reflection of that, you know, mm -hmm. and you know, in history. Um, even though there were there were hard times, but most of it was much better, much better. Yeah. Don't even hardly remember the hard times. Just think of the good stuff. You, no, yeah. no, go on. I was just saying, I'm looking forward to seeing whatever comes out of this. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I had a question for you because you mentioned that there was a, a, a place where you would eat and they called it the, the ghetto. And mm -hmm. I've done a, a few of these interviews and um, the ghetto has been described to me as a place where there was kind of like dancing. And... Oh yeah, no, we'd have parties in the ghetto as well. <laughs> you know, I'm like, basically, when you when you went up the stairs to the commons, I, it's not even there anymore. So I don't know why why I'm describing it, but you know, the commons was over where the mailboxes and stuff were. And when you went up the stairs, and there was kind of a little section to the left, and that was kind of the ghetto where we ate. ate but the section to the right was a bigger section. That's where we had parties. But it was basically upstairs in the commons where people ate. They just move all the chairs and stuff. And um, and we party over there. But the ghetto, I remember having breakfast over there more, going into the ghetto and just eating breakfast with everybody else and stuff. But yeah, definitely had parties. That's where we had the AKs and Capitals have parties together. AKs have parties and we'd have our canned good parties. It was always, I would say, call it in the commons because the ghetto, I, I thought more of the ghetto is where we ate. But definitely, okay. some people thought it was also where we party because it was the same room, basically, just this side of that side of the room. And, but, the, um, and the commons, is, um, was that near um, the student center or? Oh, no, we didn't have student center. The student center that's there now was not there when we were there. We had just a little administration building. Um, the commons was in Mesa Court. It's where those new they kind of have this new high rise apart, uh, not apartments, um, dorms, I guess now, right outside the volleyball court. I think the volleyball court is still there. Um, Cause Mesa Court used to be just one level of, um, you know, going around there might've been a few down at the bottom, but, but now Mesa Court goes several levels down toward the parking lot. And the commons was where the washer and dryers and the post office, and then the cafeteria. Yeah. And there was Jimmy who was the kind of, um, the black man, he was really short and bow-legged and he was the head of the commons. I don't know what his title was, but he was the head of the commons. And, um, and um, you know, basically the food was pretty horrible. For whatever <laughs> reason, it was good. I thought it was good in Gateway Commons. In the commons, it really wasn't. Once we got there, the food definitely took a step downward. I think my freshman year, a bunch of us got food poisoning. Just a bunch of us were sitting in the health center. There were so many of us. We were just on the floor with our own little, you know, our little, our little buckets, you know, to, so that we could, um, um, you know, basically vomit into 
but um that's terrible yeah, it, it was it was pretty bad so you know I, I don't want to mislead anybody the food was that good because it really wasn't that <laughs> good once you, once you got there steak night was good every Thursday was steak night and we all looked forward to that and we would go on Thursdays and um, have steak that was always good and you could complain to Jimmy and every once in a while he'd come up with something and stuff <laughs> like that um but um generally we would couldn't wait to get our Cal Grant, I think it was the B. There was a Cal Grant A, which kind of paid your tuition, which is only seven hundred dollars a year. By the by, the way, was the Cal Grant A. Our tuition to Irvine was seven hundred a year, wow. and then Cal Grant B kind of helped pay for books and things like that. But usually, you could save some of that money. So whenever we got our Cal Grant B money, we would go to eat, and we would go out to there was a Don Vito's across the street and a Bank of America which is the only thing in the town center that was over there. That was the only thing over there in the town center was the Bank of America and a Don Vito's, um, a little Italian restaurant. Was there a spritz garden? Swiss garden? Spritz or something, spritz garden. That I don't remember being directly across the street. There was down, Albertsons was a little further down where it is now, and there were some stores around there, but across Mm -hmm. the street was really only the bank and Don Vito's that I remember. Um... Yeah, no, I don't remember. I'm just trying to get a sense of where you were going off campus, did you? <laughs> oh, well, we had a car. I mean, I had a car because I, like I said, I went home on Tuesday and Thursdays. I had a car, so I would go home. So we would take the car, but we would go to Newport Beach and we would eat at nice restaurants because, you know, Calgary Beach was a pretty good, good amount of money. And, you know, generally, you know, they gave you money to buy books and things like that. But, you know, you bought your books used or got them from somebody else. So half the time you didn't use all the money. So you could use part of your Calgary B money for fun stuff. And so we would use our money and go eat. As soon as that check came in, we'd all, where are we going to go? And we would go to like Kano's really nice restaurants in Newport Beach. You know, we would go to, that's what the Cumbre gang did. <laughs> My little group of seven women would go and, um, and eat out at a nice place. Um, Don Vito's was when you walked into the cafeteria and it was just something you knew you couldn't eat. So then you just turned and went across the street to Don Vito's and got some pizza or spaghetti or something like that. Um, <laughs> Every once in a while, the dorms would go places like the Spaghetti Fact, the old Spaghetti Factory in Newport Beach. Our dorm would go there. That's where we would pay pass the glass. That's when we were the most obnoxious when there were 50 <laughs> kids passing glasses and singing at the top of their lungs. And um, also the crab cooker in Newport Beach we would go to because it was there back in the day in the same place. Um, so we, we definitely, you know, went out to eat when we could and or when we had to when the food was that bad. I had a hot dog cooker in my room. <laughs> that I would, you know, and it had a little thing on top. You could steam the buns so you could cook the hot dogs when you eat and steam the buns. So I would do that in my room when the food was really bad. And um, I would eat Denti more beef stew. <laughs> I would get that when the food was bad. And um, Sara Lee German chocolate cake, that was be my dessert. I would have it in my room and stuff. So, so, you know, we got along, you know, we got along. Yeah, the food was definitely not good, you know in the commons, that's for sure. And I lived in the dorms for three years. So I ate that for three years before I finally moved off campus my senior year and lived in Park West, which isn't that far off okay. campus. In fact, it became what we used to call the AK apartment because when I moved out, other AKs moved in and for years, AKs would just kind of take over the lease at that apartment and stay okay. in the same apartment in Park West. But um, yeah, there weren't too many places you know, to go. You know, one of my friends, John Elston, worked at Togo, so we would go and visit him, try to get free food as much as we could, <laughs> and go to Shakey's, um, places like that, that, you know, we could we could afford, and that you could also, like, maybe sneak a few things home in your purse and stuff, so, but, you know, it was, you know, it was good times. It was definitely all, it was, it was all good. It was all good. It was not bad at all, so. You make clear why those hot links on Ring Road were so exciting. Oh, definitely. <laughs> I don't know what I ate when I visited, but it was whatever it was. I must have just lucked up on something because I remember, definitely remember getting food poisoning. Um, and, you know, people would just play pranks, which are really horrible. One time somebody put like, I don't know if it was a, a real mouse or a fake mouse, but they put it in the waffle batter in, no. in the commons. And so if you, Gosh. because they had a waffle machine in the morning, you could, you know, dip up your batter, you know, like you could do a comfort in or any of those kind of places. And somebody dipped up something with a long tail hanging off of it. it was just like, and I'm sure it was a joke and it was probably a prank, but it was still, no one was really trying to dig deep enough to find out what it was at that time. But that's just college, you know, <laughs> definitely, definitely into a lot more pranks than I think they probably don't even do that kind of, that's probably all illegal at this point now to do that <laughs> kind of stuff. 
worse than <laughs> it was pranks, I'm sure. Putting lotion in someone's bed probably wasn't, you know, was probably frowned on, but back then it was just what we did. So, but I don't know. It, it was fun. Yeah, it was fun. UCI it was definitely a good part, a good part of my life. Yeah. I'm a proud ant eater, though. I we didn't do this. What is this thing? The ant eaters? No, we never zot, did. Zot, 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 zot. Yeah, the zot, zot, zot. Yeah, I hadn't seen that for a while. The zot, zot, zot. But I was, I was actually proud of being an ant eater. I just thought it was just so um, creative. You know, it wasn't like a Bruin or anything like that. It was an ant eater. Yeah. So, um, so that was different. So, yeah. yeah. We covered so many tape, so many great topics um, mm -hmm. during you know, this conversation, but was there anything that you really hope to cover that we didn't get a chance to talk about? Hmm. <sighs> Let's see. I think I hit pretty much everything. I mean, just, you know, just want to, you know, thank the people who are still around, you know, Janet and Barbara Burton or John Whiteley are still around, just thank them because I, while I still talk to many of the, um, you know, many of my friends from that era, my, my fellow classmates, I haven't spoken to any of them probably maybe a couple of times since graduation, but not much. So I don't, you know, know if they're still around, but if they are, I would definitely say thank you to all of them. Jim Craig, Janet Loxley, Barbara Burton, John Whiteley, Ron Wilson, who's the ombudsman. I can't remember his name. He was Ron too, I think. Um, just those people, Adriel Hamid, they were just so helpful, you know, to me, you know, as a, you know, as a kind of just a young black student trying to find her way. Yeah, they definitely, you know, helped me find my way, helped me find my, my confidence, most of all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, And definitely helped as I, you know, went on and became a lawyer, et cetera, et cetera. The stuff I learned at UCI, you know, followed me and sustained me all that time. Mm -hmm. Um, I've asked um, all of the people I've interviewed so far to describe their UCI experience in three words. Which three words would you <laughs> use? Hmm. Gosh. I guess the first one just popped my mind. It was fun. I always had fun at, at UC Irvine. Um, I guess it was eye opening. I'm trying to think of something else. Just it was positive. It was good. That was four. <laughs> it was good. I I can't think of any 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 um any good you know good good um any better words than that. I mean the first thing just sticks in my mind is that it was fun and um it just helped me grow. It helped me grow. And I don't know what word, what, what is the word for that? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, but yeah, maybe I should just say helped me grow because that's three words and it definitely helped me grow. So I'm very appreciative. Yeah. Bridget, it's been fantastic oh, getting man. to know you and Thank you. to hear all about your, your time at UCI. I really appreciate it. Okay, no, thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity. And um, I hope that, you know, this oral history project just kind of, you know, lives on. It's a huge success. Yeah. Thank okay, you. Okay, and if you have any questions or anything else, just, you know, let me know. You got my email and all that. Okay.